Hello everybody, uh, welcome to the project walkthrough for the basic web app project. Uh, this is a part of Watts 4000, building JavaScript web apps. It's also a part of the Practical JavaScript 2, building web, building web apps uh, book. Um, so we were going to be walking through three uh, small projects that are in the book in uh, sections, um, I believe it's four, five, and six. It's uh, bootstrapping the app, uh, debugging the app and deploying the app are the three sections that we're going to be uh, doing the projects in. So this is the project uh, requirements uh, for the course and this summarizes sort of what we do uh, in the book as well. We're going to bootstrap a new Vue.js uh, project skeleton. We're going to modify the HTML and the hello component. We're going to modify the styles on the hello component. We're going to modify the value of the message variable that's delivered to the template. We're going to be modifying the logic in the hello component and we're going to add a method. We're going to add an event listener to invoke the method that we just created uh, using a click event. We're going to explore debugging tools uh, and watch the values change in view dev tools. We're going to um, cause syntax error and see how that comes up in our debugging tools. We're going to modify uh, the config for building the files out to make it build properly to a docs folder. Um, we're going to modify to correct the path for our assets so that it works on GitHub pages. Um, then we're going to create a brand new repo in uh, GitHub and we're going to update the readme file uh, to put in all of the information that we need about how to work the project. Uh, we're going to push and commit our code and then we're going to configure our settings to actually serve it out from uh, GitHub pages. Um, that's everything that we're going to do. It sounds like a lot, but it actually is going to go fairly quickly. Uh, I'll work through all of those steps. I'm going to leave the stretch goals to you to figure out if you choose to pursue the stretch goals. Uh, and that's um, that's what we're going to do right now. So uh, we've provided some links here, um, but these, these are also just pages in the book. So there's um, these project pages that, like I said, are from sections 4, 5, and 6 here. Uh, and so that's what we're going to be... Uh, working through. So the first thing that we need to do is make sure that we have the view client, the view command line interface installed. So I'm just going to say view dash dash version and we can see that we're on ver version 2.8.2. If you're working this at a different point in time, then you might um, have a different version. Uh, working through this project, we're going to bootstrap the app with uh, this command view init webpack and then our project name. So I'm going to go ahead and run that command now. View init webpack. Webpack is the name of the project template. And then for this project name, I'm just going to call this basic web app. And it will ask us some questions that we can answer. Uh, we don't need to change the project name. Uh, we don't need to change the project description right now, although we could, uh, certainly. Um, the author is going to be pulled from your Git configuration. And so we're going to let that happen. Uh, we are going to build the runtime and compiler. It says recommended for most users, so that's going to be good, good for us. Um, we do not need the view router. We do not need ESLint, um, and uh, we do not need uh, Karma and Mocha or Nightwatch. Um, so that's it. It's now generated the basic web app directory so we can follow the directions that are right there on the screen and we can change directory into basic web app. And uh, if we look at the files that are here, we can see that we have all of the files that it built out in the project skeleton based on the template. So we have a package.json and that's going to have all of our uh, node module dependencies listed. So we're going to run npm install and this should install all of our dependencies and then we will be able to run the development server. I'll let this install for a while and fast forward if necessary. So that was a very quick install. NPM has gotten faster in recent years and with the recent releases, so that's excellent. Now we can run um, NPM run dev and we should be able to see this uh, in the web browser. So I'm going to go ahead and run that command. And there we go. We have the basic application up and running 
all of our dependencies have been installed successfully and we have our app uh, loading properly in the web browser. So that takes us all the way down to this part um, where we are modifying the hello component. So in order to modify the hello component, we need to open up a file uh, with Sublime. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, open a file, um, open my files from the command line like I normally do. So I'm gonna close my server with command, control C. Uh, that's on a Mac, it's control C. I believe on Windows it's control C and, and Unix is control C as well. But um, I'm going to open Sublime in this directory. Uh, and then I am going to uh, go back and run the npm run dev command again so that I have uh, the website up and running uh, once again. So that's that's all good. Now we can look here in uh, my editor and I'm using Sublime Text 3. You can use whatever editor you want to use and we can uh, see all of the files. We uh, In previous projects we've done file tours so I'm not gonna tour around these files as much but I do want to just go directly to the hello component and as you can see, the hello component contains the H1 and then the essential links uh, uh, heading there. So that's this heading, the essential links, and this H1 is populated from a variable that is defined inside of that hello component. So we're going to go ahead and modify that. And what we can see here is that we can, um, we want to change the template. So for the sake of, of brevity here, I'm just gonna copy this template out and then I'm going to come over here and paste it into my hello.view and I will see that I have um, a much shorter template and when we go back to the browser to look at this we now have these changes that have been made and we can see that our HTML changes have been successful there. So we can put whatever HTML we need to inside of these template tags and that will structure and it can contain content and everything um, and that, that will work just fine. So now we're going to keep on going down through this and the next part of the project here asks us to adjust the styles so that we can um, have styles that look a little better uh, when we're listing out those things um, so that our joke there is a little more clever. So we're going to go ahead and just again copy out those styles and paste them in here and uh, the only things that changed that we re replaced the UL style with an OL style and we added a list style type so that it would actually show numbers and everything and now if we come back here we can see that we actually have numbers and we have a vertical list so we can see the joke two things that are difficult in JavaScript naming things recursion and off by one error so this is a flavor of a really old computer science joke. Sorry that it's so terrible, but um, we can see that. We can also note that in our developer tools, if we inspect one of these things, we are gonna see the scoped styles. So if we go in here and um, bring up our inspector, you can see that uh, we're inspecting this list item here and we have this scoped style right there um, on the, on the ordered list we have that same um, attribute that scopes the style we have the same attribute on the h2 and the h1 so this entire component is scoped but notice that outside of the component they don't have the same attributes so that is how our styles are going to only affect the component and not affect anything else uh, our styles are automatically have this attribute added to them when the whole uh, system is processed and the files are bundled up for uh, use either in the development server or on production. So now we can uh, go back through and we want to um, do a little bit of logic change. We want to change just the data that is stored in this message variable. Um, so what we're going to do is look here. Now the data function is executed when the template is rendered and it returns all of the data that is defined in this object right here. So for now, we can just change this and I'm not even gonna change it to what it says in the, uh, in the book. I'm just gonna say, hello world, are you there? And uh, we will let that be. And then if we come back here and look at the web app, we can see that our, our H1 has now changed 
It says, hello world, are you there? That just happened instantly. Um, the development server auto re reloaded and that was just there. So we shouldn't have to reload the page or anything like that to see these changes come through. So now that we've altered the data, we can um, add even more data to the object and create brand new values like we see here. So all that we need to do is go into our code and add some values to this object. So we'll say num1 is 42 and num2 is 78. You can use whatever numbers you want here. Um, it really doesn't matter. Um, but then uh, we can update the template with this line of code right here in order to output those values. And so if we come back up here into the template underneath the message, I'm just going to paste in that line of code. And then we shouldn't have to refresh it all. We should just see that line of code and it shows up right there. What is 42 times 78? So that is pretty brilliant. Um, the values are coming through and they're being properly populated in the template. And, uh, and that code is showing up just fine. Um, so that's excellent. Uh, now if we go to, if we go back here, we can follow along in our little project um, guide and we can add in a little bit of event handling. So instead of just putting that one line in there, let's put these two lines in and let's take a look at what these do. Um, so, we can, uh, we can see that we have the same paragraph which does the outputs of num1 and num2. And then we have a little span here. And this span uses what's called a directive, the vif directive. And so if product is a value, this is the name of a variable. So vif will always reference some JavaScript expression inside of the quotes. If product equals something that is true, then it's going to show this span, and the span is actually just going to output the value of product here. If um, then the button has a v on directive that specifies a click event, so it says on click, it's going to execute the calculate product method. So we need to add product and calculate product into our um, into our our logic down here. So let's take a look at what that what that looks like. We get this in the guide and I'm going to go ahead and copy out this methods chunk and so that I can quickly paste it in here. Um, but basically we can initialize the product value to null which as you know in JavaScript uh, in a conditional null is false or false e. Um, so, so we'll initialize it to null so that this span will not show at first, but when the user clicks this calculate button, it's going to execute the calculate product method. And that's what we've defined here. So in our um, view component, and we'll look more in depth at how these component logic go together, but um, in the component, we've now defined a method called calculate product that can be executed. This method looks at the product num1 and num2 values and it references them using the this dot uh, syntax, which is a lot like a class in uh, ECMAScript 6 or advanced, you know, modern JavaScript. So what it does is it multiplies num1 and num2 and it comes up with a product. The product is the result of multiplication for those who forgot their math vocabulary. And, um, and so then product is going to be populated. So basically, once we click the button, product is going to be set to an actual value so then this should equal true and we should see the actual calculation show up and the result here after the question mark. So let's go ahead and hit save and um, and see if this actually works. So we're going to go back to the web app here. We have our calculate button that showed up. What is 42 times 78? If we click calculate we see 3276. So excellent. Um, we love seeing that and that's the right answer and uh, we now have our little event there. So that, that ends um, all, of the, uh, all of the work that we were going to do in terms of just sort of the app itself. So we've gone through the first third of this project. Um, you can always check out the project repository which has completed code. If you need to catch up on any of the code that was written, you can see a working version of this project in this state at the end here um, at this link right there.
Uh, but let's go on to the next project, the practice debugging project. So we need to complete this as well. And what we need to do here is just really, this is more of an observation and trying things out kind of thing. So I'm going to go back to the web browser and I'm going to refresh. And I've installed Vue Dev Tools. Uh, hopefully you've also installed Vue De Dev Tools. And we can click here on Vue and we can see all of um, the components in our view application. And when we click on these components, we can see the value of all the data that's being used in these components. At this point, we can click the calculate button and we should see this value here for product uh, change. So when we click calculate, we see 3276 show up here and simultaneously we see 3276 show up down here. So we can see the change in the value. And if we had dynamic elements that could change any of these other values, then uh, that would happen as well. So, um, so that's how we can observe the values changing in our app. We can also be alerted uh, through this system, uh, through the, the development server, that is, uh, when we do when we make a syntax error. So if I just throw a semicolon in here where it doesn't belong, I'll save that. And you can see almost immediately in the background here, we have uh, gotten an error displayed in the browser. It's overlaying actually the output of our terminal. You can see the terminal, we see the same output here. Uh, so it's showing us that in this file, hello.view, we have uh, an error and we can see that it's on this line and we can see very clearly that it's pointing to the semicolon here. Now not all syntax errors are going to be quite so easy to see but it's really nice that uh, this system allows us to sort of more easily see these syntax errors and identify them so we don't have to worry about them happening. Uh, in some systems um, errors like this are only brought up in the terminal here and it can be hard to realize sometimes that an error is happening when you're looking uh, focused on looking in this area of the browser and in your console and your and your developer tools there. So let's go ahead and fix that um, error and you'll notice that as soon as we save it in the background that page is going to refresh and go back to normal. Um, and the page itself is actually continuing to run as it um, as it always did. So uh, so that's exciting. Um, the next and that basically takes us through all of the debugging practice that we wanted to get. We really just wanted to make sure that we knew where to find the values so that we could watch values change in our app because that's a very useful debugging tool. And then also where we can um, get alerts when we make syntax errors because that's also incredibly useful. Um, so finally, let's go ahead and make the changes that we need to make in order to uh, deploy our um, web app. So uh, in order to deploy the web app, the first thing that we're going to need to do really is uh, create a repository. So I'm going to go to github.com slash R, which is my uh, personal GitHub profile, and I'm going to um, click into my repositories here and click the new button to create a new repository. Um, this repository name I'm going to call basic web app and I'll just say a basic web app for learning. And I'm gonna go ahead and leave that public and don't put any files into this directory at all. Uh, we don't need any files in the repository at all. So I'm going to create that repository and then uh, I will be able to actually follow the directions right here and I don't need to um, I don't need to just add the readme and I don't need to create the readme because I already have a bunch of files created. So if I go here to my command line, I'm going to hit control C again to end the development server and I'm going to run the git init command to actually make a new git repository inside of this uh, directory. So this directory is now a git repository. It's been initialized and you can see the path where it has been initialized there. Um, the next thing that I need to do is add my files and since I have a bunch of files here and I also have a, um, a git ignore in here so I know that I'm not going to add any bad files to this. Um, the git ignore is put there by the project template so I'm going to say git add dash capital A which is going to add everything in here uh, to my repo. And then if I run git status I can see that I have all of these files um, ready to uh, ready to be committed. So I'm going to say git commit and I'm going to go ahead and use the dash m flag and just say first commit and uh, and that's good. So then the next thing 
that I need to do. And the only thing that I really feel like you definitely have to copy out of here is just this add this remote um, URL. So you're going to add the, the remote server that lets it lets our local Git repository know that there's a remote place to put all these files. And so I'm going to add that and we're going to call the remote origin, which is a, a, a convention among Git. And so um, now I can say git push dash u origin master and it will push all these changes to the origin and it will make a connection between this master branch and the master branch in the origin um, server. So that's what I want. And once that command finishes running, then I, I should be able to see my files up on GitHub. If I hit refresh here, I can see that all of these files have gone up and I have my basic web app created. So that's great. Um, the next part, I need to actually configure Webpack. And um, to configure Webpack, I'm going to look at the config slash index.js file. So that file is located here in the config directory and then index.js. And as we can see in here, there's several places where it references the dist folder. We want that to be docs because GitHub pages will deploy the files in your docs folder as a static website. So that's what we want um, Webpack to build our files into is the docs folder. The other thing that we need to change is this assets public path because this um, path is going to be prepended to all of our all of our assets. So all of the JavaScript and CSS that goes into our, our site is going to be have this whatever this path is prepended to it. Um, in some situations, you might need that path to be something very specific. But we know that that on GitHub Pages, all projects are deployed to a subdirectory. So if we start out this path with this slash symbol then that is going to be a problem because that will make an absolute URL and we'll get 404s on our JavaScript and CSS. So we're just going to remove that and then um, hit save. And what that means is that when it builds the files, it will just build these files with uh, no path um, prepended to them, which means that they will be um, put into the HTML as relative links and they'll be able to live under that subdirectory on GitHub pages. So that, that will be excellent. Um, now that we've adjusted those two things, we can uh, run npm run build, and that's going to build out all of our documents, all of our files into the docs folder. So if we look over here on the side, we should be able to see this docs folder come into existence. And we can see here in the build report, we can see that these files were all created these were all created inside the docs folder. So if we go here and look, we can see that in fact we have all of those files put into the docs folder like this right here. And we can, if we actually look at those files, we can see that they've also been minified and uglified and uh, packaged up according to the Webpack configuration that this project skeleton comes with. And we don't need to mess with that configuration right now. So now that we have all of this in place, we need to commit and push our changes again. So we can say git status and we can see that we have a docs folder and then we also have the config slash index.js file. So I'm gonna say git add docs and then I'm gonna say git add config slash index.js and then I'm going to do a commit. I'm gonna say configure deployment and built site. And then I'm gonna say git push origin and I don't need to use the dash u on all the, the consecutive pushes because the dash u is just used the first time I make that new branch, you wanna connect it to a remote branch. So now that I have all of this in place, I can go back to the web browser here, click over to my application. Um, we can see that if we refresh here, that uh, my latest commit was 25 seconds ago, that's correct. We can go into settings and scroll down to GitHub pages here and we can choose the source and say that the source is the master branch docs folder and we can hit save and when we do that it will then uh, show us a URL where the site is going to be published. Now it'll take just a moment to publish the site so we'll spend a second and just go back here to the main page of the repository and if you hit edit up here on um, the description of your site you can paste in the URL and that will um, that will show up 
as the URL where your site is going to be deployed. So then people who look at this repo will be able to more easily see the URL where it's going to be deployed. And if we bring up this URL, hopefully it's been deployed already. And there we go. We actually can see our application is up and running. We click calculate, we get the response there, and we are now completed with this entire project. So the only things that remain are to edit the readme file that shows up here. It comes like this. We want to add information about how it's configured to deploy, um, how you need to set things up. Like right here, we get a very basic description of the build setup. Try to put this into your own words and uh, write instructions that then when you come back to this project, you'll be able to get this project up and running or get it get changes that you make in this project to deploy properly the next time. Um, and other than that, that's everything. So I hope you enjoyed putting together your first Vue.js app from the project skeleton all the way through to deployment, including some simple changes to implement your own custom functionality. Uh, we will be exploring a lot more about Vue.js in future projects, but for now, I think we're done. So take care, developers. Uh, have a good time trying this out on your own. Bye-bye.